What exactly is a reaction mechanism? Well, it's a proposal about how a reaction proceeds through a series of elementary steps. We've seen how to draw the elementary steps in a curved arrow sense and depict them using orbital interactions. But the question of how we actually arrive at a mechanism is an interesting one that we haven't touched on too much yet. How do we know what's reasonable and what's not within a reaction mechanism? Well, this has to do with the kinds of electronic movements that are allowed, as well as experimental evidence that allows us to distinguish between different types of reasonable mechanisms. And other theoretical considerations come into play here, too. Things like the stability factors, thermodynamics, and kinetics. In this lesson, we're going to talk about mechanistic reasoning, pulling in some of these concepts from physical chemistry that are important in assessing the differences between mechanisms and determining what amounts to a reasonable versus an unreasonable reaction mechanism. The enduring lesson of this series of videos is that you should really think mechanistically when predicting reactivity, rather than memorizing or trying to internalize the structural changes associated with a reaction or a particular reagent, it's better to think mechanistically. That's a more generalizable way of thinking. Probably the foundational idea of predicting mechanisms and reactivity is that reactions tend to occur through more stable intermediates and give more stable products in a thermodynamic sense, and more rapid elementary steps occur in preference to slower elementary steps, an issue of kinetics. The tool we use to think about kinetics and thermodynamics in reaction mechanisms is something we've seen before, the reaction coordinate diagram, with a number representing reaction progress on the x-axis, known as the reaction coordinate, and energy, and this is often free energy or internal energy, on the y-axis. In thinking about thermodynamics, we tend to focus on the energy valleys in reaction coordinate diagrams where stable species exist. But in thinking about kinetics, we tend to focus our attention on energy maxima on the reaction coordinate diagram, which correspond to transition states. As we've seen already, thermodynamics affects the extent of a reaction at equilibrium. In other words, how far it goes forward at equilibrium. And when we're talking about thermodynamics here, we're really referring to delta G, which is influenced by the stability factors that we've discussed previously. All viable organic reactions have to be thermodynamically favorable or thermoneutral overall. That said, within a mechanism, unfavorable steps can and do occur. However, we eventually have to reach a situation where we're back to either an overall favorable process or one that is approximately thermoneutral, where we can use Le Chatelier's principle to drive the reaction forward. So, on this mechanism here, for example, if we draw a really long reaction coordinate diagram underneath this mechanism, what we find is that the overall process is thermodynamically favorable. However, intermediates within the reaction pathway are higher in energy than the reactants are. This uphill climb in the first step means that that first step actually favors the reactants. However, we can get what kind of amounts to Le Chatelier's principle operating within this reaction mechanism to drive the reaction forward. Since the next step is favorable, as soon as a carbocation is formed here, it's going to be consumed through reaction with water to generate the next intermediate. That consumption knocks the first step out of equilibrium, driving forward the formation of more carbocation. One kind of intuitive way to think about this is that what goes up must come down. Intermediates in a reaction mechanism are very often less stable than the reactants. However, the final products will be either of almost equivalent stability to the reactants or more stable than the reactants. One last thing to say here is that changes to the energy of these intermediates will affect the favorability of steps within the reaction mechanism. And what we can say in general is that lower energy intermediates, intermediates that are lower on the reaction coordinate diagram will tend to be favored over higher energy intermediates. We're going to see this throughout the course in cases where multiple reaction pathways may take place. More stable intermediates are favored over less stable intermediates. Kinetics, which is wrapped up in the activation energy, delta G double dagger, affects reaction speed. And since delta G double dagger refers to an energy difference between a stable species and a transition state, we really need to consider the stabilities of transition states when evaluating kinetics. The situation here, though, is analogous to the thermodynamic situation in the sense that more stable transition states will tend to be associated with, and so, for example, the transition state of the first step of this, this mechanism, which is 
rate determining, which we'll see in a later lesson actually, is going to be somewhere here higher in energy than the intermediates that are formed. Structural changes to the reactants that would stabilize this transition state or changes in reaction conditions like changes in the solvent, for example, are going to tend to accelerate the reaction as they're lowering the activation energy for the process. And one thing to keep in mind here is that the transition state energy is not necessarily directly related to the energies of the reactants or products. Although product and transition state energies are often correlated with one another, that relationship doesn't have to be there. And so thermodynamically favorable does not always mean fast and thermodynamically unfavorable does not always mean slow. And a good example of the latter would be an unfavorable acid-base process, which comes to equilibrium extremely rapidly, but is nonetheless unfavorable. The big idea here is that we have to think about kinetics and thermodynamics separately. Kinetics deals with transition states and reaction speed, while thermodynamics deals with the stabilities of reactants, products, and intermediates, and has to do with reaction extent. Because there are two separate issues here, thermodynamics and kinetics, we can get into an interesting situation where two competing reaction pathways might have different senses of favorability. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say we start with a starting material. Let's call it S. And S has the potential to form two products with different structures, P1, which is lower in energy, and P2, which is higher in energy. The highest energy transition state leading from the starting material to P1 is going to correspond to the activation energy of that process. So for example, if TS1 is here, the activation energy for the reaction leading from S to P1 is the energy difference between the starting material and TS1. Likewise, in going from S to P2, the activation energy here is the difference in energy between the highest energy transition state leading from S to P2 and the starting material's energy. The thermodynamic energy difference, or the thermodynamic change in energy in going from S to P2, is this difference between the starting material and P2's energy. And we label this using delta G naught. Let's call it delta G naught 2. Delta G naught 1 is the energy difference between S and P1. And now that we've laid down these four energy differences, we can see what's really interesting about this particular situation. The pathway leading from S to P1 is favored thermodynamically, ultimately because P1 is lower in energy than P2. P1 is more stable than P2. But this process, this pathway going from S to P1, is slower than the pathway going from S to P2. Put another way, the pathway leading from S to P2 is favored kinetically. It just occurs more rapidly. This means that under circumstances in which kinetics or reaction speed is dictating the outcome of the reaction, and these would be early times or relatively low temperatures where it takes a long time for the reaction to come to equilibrium, the pathway leading to P2 will be favored. But under circumstances where thermodynamics is dominating the outcome of the reaction, and these would be the opposite, long reaction times, and high temperatures giving the reaction ample chance to come to equilibrium, the pathway leading from S to P1 will be favored. Put yet another way, reactions under thermodynamic control will lead to P1, while reactions under kinetic control will lead to P2. We may see specific examples of this phenomenon in action later in the course, but I wanted to bring it up here to give us a sense of how kinetics and thermodynamics play into the outcomes of reactions. The lower activation energy is associated with the faster reaction pathway, while the lower energy product, or the more negative free energy change overall, is associated with the pathway that's favored thermodynamically. 